Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. My name is Janet Anderson. I'm the Commissioner of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission and it's great to have you at this webinar this afternoon where we're going to be talking about food, nutrition and the dining experience for uh, residents of aged care facilities. I want to start by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we're meeting around Australia uh, and paying my respects to elders past and present and indeed any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. As I said, we're going to be talking about food, dining and nutrition in aged care with a particular focus on the dining experience and resident choice. And I'm very pleased to be joined by four panellists, uh, Dr Melanie Roth, who is the Chief Clinic Advisor in the Commission, Sue Hyde, uh, who is uh, an occupational therapist by, by qualification at working in Dementia Australia. Vanessa Schult, who is an accredited practicing dietitian representing Dietitians Australia today, and Kate Dalton, uh, who is an aged care advocate working in the Elder, Elder Rights Advocacy Service, which is a member of the Older Persons Advocacy Network, uh, a, an affiliated uh, federal set of organisations. We've allocated 90 minutes to today's webinar and we are recording it uh, so it will be available for viewing uh, on a time shifted basis uh, and each of our panelists is going to give an overview of a good dining experience how to support consumer choice and various aspects of that uh, and after we hear from the panelists there will be an opportunity for questions and answers so i have some requests for you we have received a few questions in advance of the webinar um, and we're looking for you to contribute your questions as we go through. So please uh, send them in to us uh, and we'll do our best to address as many of them as possible. And if there are some that we don't get to, we will be putting up a Q&A uh, sheet on our website after the webinar so that you can visit that and uh, refresh uh, any information that uh, we may have covered and certainly uh, take on board any new information that we're able to provide afterwards. Um, so while you're starting to think about some of the questions you might want to ask, let me just give a brief introduction. Why a webinar on food and nutrition? Well, the short answer is uh, that as a regulator, we have become uh, aware of and a bit concerned about some of the variations in practice that we have seen uh, in relation to food and nutrition, and particularly where it wasn't receiving the attention that we considered it deserved. Um, our work on food, nutrition and dining is actually part of what we call a campaign approach where we are looking to build providers' capability and, and their workers' capability to identify and act early on areas that impact eating, but equally looking to engage directly with and support consumers to understand how they can identify and raise concerns confidently and contribute to problem solving uh, alongside their uh, aged care workers and providers. So what we're hoping for is that overall, this will have a positive impact on consumers' experience of aged care. We have produced a number of resources, uh, and I expect that Melanie may make mention of these. They actually cover four areas impacting eating. One, the dining experience. Two, consumer choice. Three, oral health. And uh, four, swallowing. Uh, and they are going to be supported by a number of webinars of which this is the first. Now, you may be wondering why you've been invited to attend this webinar. The short answer to that is that we undertook a, an analysis of our data holdings in an effort to identify what we thought might be that cohort of uh, residential aged care providers who could be, could be at increased risk of uh, underperformance on food, nutrition and the dining experience. Now, you may not regard yourself as being in that category and certainly this is not an exact science. It may be that you consider that you are kicking goals in this area and that you have nothing more to learn. I actually would be surprised if any provider would put themselves in the category of knowing everything there is to know about this. So even if you consider that you are doing a pretty good job of this already, I hope you'll get something from this in terms of tips and tricks, uh, confirmation that you're on the right track, or possibly even use the chat line to share your experiences and, and the good news stories. Um, 
we have observed many examples of good practice in this area. Attractive meal presentation that helps stimulate appetites, resident cards that document preferences so that you know what individual consumers like and don't like, and then a, a daily quality test by a member of the management team in relation to taste, texture, aroma, which, which is reinforcement uh, for people in charge as to how uh, food and nutrition is being managed um, you know, on a particular day. And all of these examples are really encouraging. We've also, as I said earlier, observed where we've been less impressed by uh, some practices in relation to food and nutrition. And uh, those are worth sharing too, judiciously, as learning opportunities. So this program is about engaging with you on a learning journey to identify some of the things that we know and understand relate to best practice and reflect that back to you. And this web webinar, as I said earlier, is actually the first of four that we intend to deliver for you, which I believe signals our seriousness in investing in education and uh, sort of trialing this approach, I suppose, to our engagement with you directly through this virtual platform, giving you further intelligence, further information, further guidance, and hearing back from you as well. And we're very, very keen to get your feedback. There is a survey at the end of this session, and we're very keen, please, for you to stay around. It won't take terribly long to complete. If you are able to give us that additional time at the end of this webinar to complete the survey, we will gain more from you and your participation, which is part of our learning journey. So without further ado, I'd like to now hand over to the first panelist, who is Dr. Roth. And uh, Melanie is going to talk about the impact uh, that an enjoyable or unenjoyable meal has on a, an aged care consumer's quality of life, health and well-being, and some of the priority areas that we've been addressing. Melanie. Thanks very much, Janet. This is very exciting. Food is a, a topic very dear to me. Um, and so I'm hoping to give you an overview in the next few minutes of food and dining in aged care from a, a clinical perspective. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about the impact of leadership on effective food governance arrangements. So <clears throat> I, I, I just want to say right at the beginning that, that looking at food does not just mean ticking off a menu. And I know that uh, subsequent speakers are going to have to have a, a little bit more say about this, but um, food, dining and nutrition have far reaching impacts when it comes to a resident's health and well-being and, and their quality of life. And just I'm now of an age where most of my friends, if they're, they're lucky enough to have parents still alive, many of them are in aged care. And I've got two friends um, who very recently, one of them I said, how's your mum? And she said, oh, God, mum's a foodie and the food is terrible. It's bland and boring. She hates it. And the other one who, who said, I love visiting dad. The food is great. It always smells good. I'm usually offered some. And even when I go and nobody's expecting me, he's, he's eating with gusto and loving what he's given. Often in aged care, the focus is, is just on a resident's weight, um, but we really need to broaden our focus to look at the experience as a whole. Weight loss is a, a late and a blunt tool. Um, if you're only detecting problems when you're detecting weight loss, then, then you're, you're leaving it too late. Really, problems can be detected very early um, when somebody appears not to be enjoying their food, when they start leaving bits, where they're missing meals, where they're refusing food if, if they're being um, assisted to eat. And, and really, the one step prior to that is, is prevention. So it's predicting when problems might occur rather than waiting, waiting until, until they do and, of course, sorting them out. Uh, so it's really important that you and, and your organisation understand why fooding, food and dining is important as a priority for your organisation and its culture, its governance and its very reputation. Um, it's important to understand the breadth of factors and the issues that can contribute to food and nutrition in aged care, and I'll, I'll go through those fairly quickly, but also to understand the impact of food, nutrition and dining on health, well-being, and quality of life, which, which really is why it's so important. Um, there are 
many things really that can impact on a resident's ability to receive good nutrition. So I just want to go through some of those some of those things because if you don't understand what these things are, then you're not going to be able to respond fully to trying to understand why people are not eating as well as you would like them to be or as well as they would like to. So, so the first thing really is, is appetite. So that's really the desire to eat and somebody with a poor appetite can have many causes for that. Many of those are, are quite intuitive, um, but, but it might be a new medical condition. They might be unwell in some way. They might be developing an infection or a malignancy or any other um, new medical condition which may be reversible or treatable. Um, there may be psychological factors, for example, depression, loneliness, isolation, um, all of those things that would probably make you eat less if you were forced to eat in, in different circumstances from how, you, how you're eating at home. Medications are a potent influencer of appetite. There are many medications which will, will decrease appetite. Um, in particular, psychotropics do, um, certain antibiotics do, and many other medications. Some are even used for their appetite suppressing uh, qualities. Um, then there's also where people have cognitive impairment of some sort and they are unable to interpret the feeling of hunger. They interpret the feeling as, as some sort of discomfort, but they're unable to make that intellectual step, step of saying, actually, I'm hungry and I can solve that problem by going to eat. Many people will just become either agitated or, or miserable. Um, and of course, what else affects the appetite is is the food itself. It's what it looks like. It's what it smells like. I don't know if you've been into places or whether your own place, when you walk in, it just smells like funny food. It smells like institutional food mixed up with a, a, a dishwater sort of smell. I can't put my finger on what that smell is, but it's not the sort of smell that when you associate it with food makes you want to eat it. Um, so the, the food has to be delicious for that person um, in order for them to want to eat it. It has to be something that they feel like eating today that, that is familiar to them um, or that is something new that they want to try or whatever state of mind they're in. It has to be something that, that is possibly delicious for that person. As soon as they find that it's too cold or too dry or too mushed or it looks exactly the same as the previous four meals they've had, then that really does impact on your appetite. It's also the issue of access to food when you want or need it. So some people, as a lifelong habit, or some people, as they get older, prefer snacking through the day rather than sticking to the traditional three meals. Some people never eat breakfast. Uh, some people always want second helpings. Um, some people can only manage small volumes at a time, which means they need to eat more frequently or they need more time to eat it. Um, some people can't reach the food that they're served or they can't open the packets or they can't get it into their mouth. So that comes to feeding assistance. Is that fit for purpose? Um, you know, people don't like to be given assistance to eat when they can feed themselves. Um, but also if the person is talking to other people and just really shoveling food into their mouth or um, putting the next mouthful in before you finished the, the previous one, then that will quickly lead to people not wanting to have the next mouthful. Um, many people with, with uh, chronic illness or frailty will fatigue very easily, so they need more time to eat. And again, those people might need to eat more frequently, smaller volumes. So having access to, to the ability to, to do that, either of their own volition or in an assisted manner is, is really important. Don't forget the mouth. Um, oral health is, is um, qu quite acknowledged, certainly in, in the Royal Commission, to be under um, under looked at in, in aged care and where teeth are not fit for the type of food that's being given to someone or whether that decision has been made without the person and they're, they're given food that's of a consistency that they would rather not be having, where chewing causes pain, where medication or illness causes mouth dryness or, or dehydration. Um, and where dentures are required and not used or not cleaned. Um, and in people living with dementia, 
oral health can actually deteriorate quite quickly. So it is something that you need to bear in mind if as a possible cause of somebody that's starting to eat less or show less, uh, less pleasure from eating. Then, of course, we get on to swallowing issues, which we will address in another webinar in, in more detail. Swallowing is very complex. And many age-related conditions impact on swallowing, for example, strokes, Parkinson's disease, et cetera, and, and of course, late-stage late dementia. Um, but swallowing problems can be unrecognised or they can actually be assumed to be present and addressed with intervention when intervention isn't actually needed or when it's not wanted. So people may be too quickly put on thickened fluids, etc. So it's important to remember that there's a risk associated with a resident not wanting to eat texture modified foods, just as there is a risk to eating with a swallowing issue. So if somebody's given a texture that they don't like, they are um, at much greater risk of eating an insufficient amount and, and developing malnutrition, which was unne potentially unnecessary or is a greater risk than the risk that's being developed. Um, many people as they age, and particularly with certain conditions and certain medications, have slowed gut transit, early fullness, um, and, and again, these people may need to eat little and often. Then there is um, the attitudes of those caring for the residents. So sometimes food is restricted if somebody is deemed to be overweight or if they're deemed not, not to be um, suitable to have certain foods with, with such things as added salt or high fat or second helpings or too much sugar, etc. And And often this comes with good intentions but can be misinformed. Um, and where you have insufficient nutrition, you'll often see loss of muscle mass and body fat, loss of strength, loss of function, an increase in falls, a higher risk of fracture, higher risk of pressure injury, a lowered immune system with a susceptibility to infections, impaired wound healing and um, a, a rapid progression to, to frailty and, um, and an earlier death than you otherwise might have. So you can see that um, all of those things can impact on a person's quality of life. Um, that's because they decrease somebody's ability to engage in activities that they find enjoyable or to engage in, in interactions with other people. Um, and of course, we must never underestimate the joy and comfort that food can bring to people, particularly if it's really the only pleasurable activity that that, that they perceive that they have left. Um, and and it's an opportunity to be very aware of and and assist with um, making things familiar, um, making people feel special, giving people treats. Um, there are rituals associated with various cultural. Um, cultural food practices. And for many people in aged care, really their, their day's joy comes predominantly from mealtimes, as long as those meals are enjoyable. I uh, just wanted to briefly touch on, on some work that the, that the Commission did. We, we engaged um, Health Outcomes International to analyse consumer complaints to the Commission over three calendar years. These were thousands of complaints in relation to food and dining. Um, and the outcomes of that were have have been published on on our website, but they cl it clearly identifies priority areas. Um, it, it's often just the basics that really generated complaints, um, and I can go into that in more detail uh, later. But the report's currently available for you to read, um, and and just also very briefly then. Um, what, what strategies can governing bodies or management adopt to satisfy yourselves that food and nutrition is, is being delivered well? And, and I would really encourage you to start by a genuine and meaningful engagement with consumers. So not just fielding complaints and doing something with them or not, but actually going and actively seeking input, asking people how they're finding the food and what could be improved for them. Um, and also making a, a serious attempt to um, assess things from the point of view of residents who can't actually answer those questions for themselves. Find alternative means. Go and look at the food yourself. Go in and watch people eating, see how it's set up, smell it, see what they're being given, what does it look like, taste it, listen to what's happening in the dining room. Put yourself in the shoes of each consumer. 
is this process working for each consumer? Is this the sort of place I would want to be eating in? Is this the sort of food I'd want to be eating if if I were in this service? Um, look really close, closely at your processes, what exactly has been eaten, not just what's on the menu. Um, empower your staff, including chefs, to, to come and see the impact of what they're producing. It, it's um, a really good um, positive feedback system. Um, identify components for action and improvement as you find them. Um, make sure there are clear responsibilities and, and that staff with, with roles and responsibilities are enabled to oversee quality and improvement. And being really alert to intersections with other areas. So where you're finding pre increasing pressure injuries, increasing falls, um, slow to heal wounds, uh, low levels of consumer satisfaction, just go back and see whether mm -hmm. food could be a potential component of that because um, it often will be at least partially. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, an enormous amount of information communicated there, and I think very successfully in a fairly short space of time. Uh, you may well, uh, for that reason alone, want to go and have another look at this webinar when you get when you get the recording, uh, because uh, I actually think it, it might reward a second a second viewing. Let's move on to the next panelist now, and I invite Sue Hyde uh, to join us. As I said in the introduction, Sue actually works with Dementia Australia. Her background is in occupational therapy, but uh, uh, she has some really important uh, issues to share with us in relation to the dining experience. Sue. Thanks very much, Janet, and thank you for inviting me to the webinar. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we're virtually meeting on today, and for my region, that's the Yugam language region, and pay my respects to elders both past, present, and, and, and to our shared futures. I'm going to talk today about the dining and the mealtime experience for people living with dementia. But what I what I'm going to talk about is relevant to any of your um, residents. It will also assist people who are visually impaired, people who have other disabilities and also people where maybe English is their um, second language. Firstly, before I start, though, I'd like you to take a moment to consider your own routine and preferences around meal times, because when we talk about the meal time, we don't just talk about sitting down to eat. Your own meal time will start with the menu planning, preparing the food, laying the table, cooking the food, sitting down and then clearing away at the end. And this would have been the same for all of your residents as well. And we often very much ask about what someone's likes and dislikes are, but we very rarely ask them much more than that. We may ask what their allergies are, etc. But we really need to ask more than that. What are their own particular routines and preferences around their meal time? Now, for some people, you may not enjoy any of that process. You might find that whole um, that whole process a chore. For other people, the kitchen is the heart of their uh, their home. It's a social place. People cook together. Everyone sits around the table, and it's an extremely important part of their life. And to actually remove that um, is something that is actually quite distressing for people. Um, and to sort of reinforce what Melanie has been talking about is people with dementia are much more vulnerable to nutrition issues. Um, they may not recognise the food or utensils and they may actually have forgotten how to eat. We had a lovely gentleman that used to come to our day respite centre who could eat independently at the respite centre, but he couldn't eat independently at home. And his wife was very puzzled about that. And what it was, was he sat by himself at home. His wife didn't sit with him. But when he was at the day respite centre, he was watching everybody do this. And that was the prompt that he needed to be independent. And if you actually assisted him to eat, he'd become very agitated because he could actually eat. He just needed that visual prompting first. As people progress with their dementia, their communication difficulties are going to be exaggerated and people will, will actually end up being nonverbal. And so it's really important that we adapt our communication, especially when we're looking at choice for, for, for your residents. Even a simple question like, would you like tea or coffee can be too complex. We might need to break that down to, would you like tea? And the person can either nod or shake their head, yes or no. So we need to simplify the language we use. Melanie's covered um, the difficulty swallowing as people progress with their dementia and the poor oral and dental health that can really impact somebody's um, eating experience because often there may be pain, there may be loose dentures, um, things that are going to impact whether somebody actually enjoys that meal. There's also a lot of assumptions about people living with dementia. Well, they won't remember anyway. There's no point in asking them because they can't tell us. 
Um, I was given a very sad example in residential care when I was teaching there and the staff said they were very distraught really with the chef because the chef knew this lady didn't like fish but continued to give her fish because he, he said well she's not complaining about it there's no reason for me to change and the lady couldn't verbalize um, that she didn't like food but also a lot of our older generation are very reluctant to actually um, tell people that there, there is a problem and, and they will refrain from doing that so her needs were not being Left. There's, I'm so sure a lot of these you're going to be familiar with signs that something may be wrong, but I'm just going to go into a couple of these. So if people are pushing away or refusing, I, I, I like to say declining their food, we need to look at what's behind that. Um, you know, sometimes it may be that the person's got a full continence pad. Maybe they need the toilet and, and they haven't been to the toilet before their food. Maybe it's culturally not appropriate for them. Or, you know, they like hand washing first um, before they sit down and that hasn't been done. So we need to go back to why somebody isn't eating food and why they're actually pushing it away. My husband's aunt was in a residential care facility and had lost 10 kilos in weight. And when we went to visit her, her husband was actually attending every Every single meal time because it would take her about an hour to eat. She could independently eat but she'd very slowly eat a mouthful, eat another mouthful and then she would fall asleep. Now what would happen if her husband wasn't there is that food would be removed because they believe that she'd finished and 10 kilos in weight is a massive amount so he used to stay with her while she slowly ate just to ensure that she got that food in. Um, often, um, you know, for people with dementia, maybe where their parietal lobes have been impacted, there's a lot of perceptual changes and people can actually say that food tastes like bleach. A lot of people, especially with frontotemporal dementia, will be very, um, they will love sugar. They will suddenly go from having not had a sweet diet to wanting sugar all the time. Um, so we need to go back to, you know, why is someone not eating and, and, and are we modifying things for somebody if there's obviously a problem that we're, um, we're seeing? And it can sometimes be that the person's actually just too embarrassed to be assisted to eat in the dining room when actually they know they can eat themselves. I like you to think about it more, it's more than just the meal. We really need staff to be on board, but this is one of the most important activities of the day. And probably the best results I've seen are facilities where all staff are on the floor at the dining time. So the, the, the residents are getting the assistance they need. There's you know, not three staff are under pressure to do everything, because otherwise what you'll find is the residents will actually go hungry because they may need assistance and that's not being provided. Um, we also need to consider um, the language that we're actually using um, to support dignity. And I still frequently hear, Mary's a feed, can you go and help her? She needs assistance. We really need to be using the language, Mary needs assistance to eat, not Mary's a feed. And if you're actually talking to Mary, rather than saying, Mary, would you like me to feed you now? Mary, what help would you like? And, and, and see if you can get guidance from the person as to what, what you need, uh, what she needs you to do. It's really important um, to look at food choice on the day and the most successful places I've been is where um, they have show plates and they'll actually bring out the choices on the day for someone to actually look at. There have been some situations where the person actually wants to take the plate but it's, it's a minimal issue and people can then choose there and then what they want. I'm sure you've all been to a wedding where you were asked four months in advance to actually choose what you want and you get there on the day and you always want what somebody else has. And I think that can be a little bit of the case with your residents. Um, I visited a facility um, in, the, in the bush a little bit who actually int introduced buffet style dining and they had phenomenal success. Um, weight went up, people were so much happier, complaints went down. There were some odd choices, like people put a, you know, a, a fried egg on top of their cereal, but they actually loved that experience. And I don't know about you, when I go into a buffet style dining, it's like, oh, what can I have? And there was very much that feeling from the residents about the buffet style dining. Um, there have been buffet style dining as well, where it's actually behind a glass, um, a glass cover, and the resident comes up and makes choices um, and somebody actually serves their food. So thinking about how, especially for people um, where they have dementia and maybe they can't read anymore, it's a great way of supporting them. We need to look at all the environmental considerations that can actually impact the dining experience. Firstly, is the dining room somewhere you'd want to eat? Is it familiar? Is it friendly? Is it inviting? Would you want to be there? 
are there options of where to sit? You know, some people just want to sit by themselves. They don't want to sit with others. Have you got those options? Are there seats inside and out? We also need to consider things like the lighting and the noise levels that are in there. But we also need to consider things such as contrast. And you can see on the top right picture, the chairs contrast really well with the floor so the person can find the chair and it's quite safe for them to sit on it. With the bottom picture on the left, the plate can be seen. I had a lady that was visually impaired as well as having dementia and she needed to eat um, yogurt but it was white yogurt in a white bowl on a white tablecloth and she had no idea where it was. So what happened was the staff came across to assist her, but she became agitated with them because she could independently eat. And when they actually realized this, they actually placed her yogurt in a blue bowl instead and she was then able to find her food. So we're supporting somebody's independence. So there's lots of environmental considerations that we need to, um, we need to look at. When we're talking about culture as well, we need to think about more than just the cultural food. If somebody is Muslim during Ramadan, they're not going to eat after sunrise and before sunset. Do we support that? Some people actually eat on the floor. Many, many people eat with their hands. Um, cutlery is different for different cultures. I went to Thailand. It was a, you know, it was a fork and a spoon. Do we provide the tools that are recognizable for somebody so that they can continue to eat? Frequently, um, staff are reporting to me that there's much poorer presentation for modified diets. And the one on the left is what most people report to me. It may be broccoli, it may be peas, it may be green beans, but it's still green. And so green, orange, brown and white is what's presented at every meal. I know there's some issues sometimes with molds. They do pr provide a much more attractive um, plate, um, but you can pipe food. There's a whole range of different things you can do. And often people with modified diets are never provide menus. And if somebody has dementia, a picture menu can speak a thousand words. And what a picture menu does as well is often people don't understand the language we use for the foods that we name. Mongolian lamb, kakiatori chicken. Sometimes for someone living with dementia or not, that doesn't mean anything. They have no idea what that food is. But if you can provide a picture menu, they can point to choose, which, you know, you know, this is what it's about. It's about encouraging people to choose their own food. Um, so it's really important to provide those um, picture menus. It's important for the chefs to, to sit down with the residents and menu plan. My husband was a chef at a day respite center in the UK and all the members came up to him and said, can you cook tripe and onions? It's our comfort food. It's what we've known all of our lives. Now, he'd never cooked it before and they took great delight in guiding him on how to cook tripe and onions. Now, when the manager came through and saw what it, saw what it looked like, because tripe and onions isn't necessarily an attractive food to present, it is a little bit gray and doesn't look so um, appealing. She said, never ever cook that food in my day respite center again. Luckily they had a very um, active member of the group who went up, to, went up to the manager after and said, that's what we want, that's what we chose, that's what we're having again. So we have to think about, do we provide food for family members who come in and look at the plate? Do we provide it or do we provide it for the residents? And sometimes that's going to be things that not necessarily we would look at and choose. Um, you know, uh, dripping on toast was a common one when I was a kid. That's my parents came from a ration time. We have to consider the other other meals that people may like. We also need to consider the routines, rituals and habits of people. And as I said, this isn't just about likes and dislikes. Do they like their food not touching? Does their gravy have to be on the side? Um, you know, was Friday night pizza night? Did they always eat their meal sitting in front of the TV? Um, there's a lot of different things that I'm sure all of you will think about that is really important to you um, for your habits. And if you look at the picture on the top right, it's really important to involve your residents in that actual meal prep. I had a lovely gentleman who was very agitated. I was working as a DBMAS consultant at the time and his daughter said, I think he's bored. Boredom is the, the bottom line for a lot of people why they're agitated. She said he ran a restaurant. He loves food. So they actually got him to sit down, peel carrots, peel potatoes, and all his behaviors disappeared because he was engaged. He was doing something that had been part of his life. So get your residents involved. All of our day respite people go in the kitchen. 
often people get very worried about people being in the kitchen, but they do exactly what the chefs do. They wash their hands, they put a hairnet on and they put an apron on and they enter the kitchen. But you'll often find that people in residential care are not allowed into the kitchen. But even for people with mobility problems, you can bring them out of the kitchen, as in that picture. You can sit people down, they can, they can prepare carrots at the kitchen table. And it's an incredibly important activity for everybody. So what can we do to improve the dining experience? We can certainly provide a resident kitchen, a residence kitchen or access to the main kitchen. Um, it's part of what people do day in, day out of their lives and we need to maintain that for people. Staff and chef education about dementia, um, the difficulties with eating, the reasons why someone may not eat and the impact of poor nutrition. And one of the best experiences I had when I was teaching was I actually, we did, actually did some experiential learning. We blindfolded, um, we, we paired people up, we blindfolded one of the staff and we got the other staff member to assist them to eat. There's no better way of learning about what you like and what you don't like when you're being assisted by actually being on the receiving end of it. It's really important for staff and management and chefs to actually dine with the residents. A, it shows that you'll eat the food that's being prepared, but also it gives you the opportunity to go, well, do I like the dining room? What's going on here? What are the things that I wouldn't like if I had to eat here every day? It's really important to promote independence. Um, this really impacts self-esteem. So if you're assisting, assisting somebody to eat who could actually do it independently, if maybe they had an OT assessment, um, you can see the cutlery at the bottom of the slide. Um, it's, it's a strap that goes round so that the person who maybe don't, doesn't have fine finger movement anymore and keeps dropping their spoon can remain independent. Um, and it's really in, uh, um, important to recognise the importance of engagement, as I said. Get your residents involved at every stage, lay the table, prepare the food, be involved in the menu planning, cooking the food and then um, enjoying it and clearing away at the end of the day. What I'd just like to leave you with really is, if you entered residential care, I would like to ask you, how would you feel if you were no longer able to be involved in any part of the mealtime process except for sitting down and eating? You no longer had choice over what you ate. You never accessed a kitchen again. And what far food or part of that process could you not live without? Thank you very much. Oh. Sue, so, um, thank you. That, that really was wonderful. And again, another recommendation, I think, for a repeat viewing. You've given us so much to think about in, in, your, in your comments. Let's move now to the next presenter. And I introduce again um, Vanessa Short. Now, Vanessa is working as a senior policy officer at Dietitians Australia. Uh, and Vanessa is going to talk to us about, uh, well, around the general topic area of food and residential care. Thanks, Vanessa. Great, thanks Janet, and uh, greetings from Dharawal country in uh, the Illawarra. I'd like to acknowledge all traditional custodians of the lands, waters and seas that we work and live and play uh, on across Australia. I pay respects to elders past, present and future and thank them for their continuing leadership, knowledges and custodianship. All right, so today we're going to be talking about food, nutrition and the dining experience. So I'd like to start with by putting forward a question. Why does food, nutrition and the dining experience matter? Well, it matters to the residents that you look after because this is their home. The food, nutrition and dining experience that you offer is vital to their quality of life and well-being. And if we move anti-clockwise around the picture, looking at falls and fractures. So a nutritious diet reduces the risk of falls and fractures. So there was a two year study with almost 7,200 aged care residents from 60 uh, residential aged care homes in Australia. And with the female residents, they were given four servings of dairy food a day and the male residents were given three and a half servings a day. And this food strategy alone reduced the risk of all fractures by 33% and it reduced the risk of falls by 11%. So dairy foods are a relatively inexpensive way, inexpensive way to reduce the risk of falls and fractures. So moving again anti-clockwise, looking at the social and emotional well-being. So a quality dining experience matters as it's vital for social and emotional 
wellbeing. In terms of dehydration, encouraging and monitoring the consumption of fluids protects against dehydration and subse subsequent hospitalisation. With pressure injuries, so adequate calories, protein, fluids, vitamins and minerals are required by the body to maintain tissue integrity and to prevent tissue or skin breakdown, which reduces the risk of developing pressure injuries and wounds. In terms of malnutrition, good food and nutrition based on the resident's preferences and their choices reduces the risk of malnutrition and unplanned weight loss. And in terms of mental health, so food and, nutri food and nutrients have a direct impact on mental health. Research shows that a healthy diet helps to support a healthy brain structure and function. So you can see that there are many reasons why food and nutrition is important in residential aged care. So if we have a look at the, um, the, the nutrition needs of our older residents, they are indeed unique. Um, and I will underline, I should have underlined that word unique. They have, um, once we're, as we age, our nutrition needs actually change. So our need for protein actually increases. Some may, you know, may have thought that perhaps it reduces, but it actually increases. So, um, and so does that of uh, calcium. So, uh, and that this, from the age of uh, 65 years and up, this is, um, this is uh, uh, what we need. We actually need to have more protein in our diet to be able to um, build and maintain muscles. So in terms of meals, main meals, so breakfast, lunch and dinner, we're looking at around 25 to 30 grams of protein per main meal. So that, that's really important to take into consideration. They also need to be adequate amounts of calcium and dietary fibre for, for good bowel function. So uh, the nutritious um, offering, nutritious mid-meal snack offerings is, is really important. So for morning tea, afternoon tea and supper, um, and it's, you know, like I just talked about with that research, try and think dairy. So dairy foods, milk, cheese, yogurt, custard. They, they're, you know, essential, um, high, very high quality protein snacks and foods, which we can quite easily incorporate into the menu. Small appetites are very common, so every mouthful counts. So a dietitian can assist you to boost the protein and the energy content of meals without increasing the quantity of the food that the person needs to eat. Adequate fluids are really important too, and this is obviously to, to prevent uh, dehydration. And food is only nutritious if it's eaten. So we must cater to all residents' food, drink and dining preferences and their choices. And it's really important to reassess that on a regular basis because they change. I don't know. I don't know about you, but um, you know, during my lifespan, my my tastes and my preferences have actually changed. So we need to continually assess and reassess and ask: um, Is this to your to your satisfaction? And um, in terms of taking that food first approach, it's very important uh, that you know you can maximise the nutritional value of meals by adding nourishing ingredients to the food served. So by adding skim milk powder to milk that, that provides um, a milk that's super boosted in protein. You can add skim milk powder to mashed potato or to soups and casseroles and, and curries, that sort of thing. You might add some grated, grated cheese on top of meals that's giving a little bit of a protein boost. Uh, add some cream to, to soups that's adding some energy for, for people who are frail or who are losing some weight. So it's important to use oral nutrition supplements only if necessary, such as when nutritional requirements are unable to be met through food alone. And this should be done under the supervision of a dietitian. And uh, it's really important in terms of taste fatigue, which is quite common with nutrition supplements, that it needs to be uh, assessed um, and reviewed regularly to ensure that uh, taste fatigue um, for those that are having supplements is not an issue and um, jeopardising their nutrient intake. So if we just have a quick look at some nutritious foods here, first we'll have a look at some snacks. It's really, um, it's good to use mid meals as an opportunity to sneak some protein and some calcium in there. 
So if we have a look at here, we've got some as a meal snack. We've got morning for morning tea, some cheese and crackers. Uh, over here on the far right hand side, milkshakes. Milkshakes are super, you know, you can, they're very versatile. You can turn them into smoothies. You can have all different flavours. Presenting them nicely, just putting that little bit of fruit on the side or putting it perhaps into a um, stainless steel milkshake container can bring back fond memories of having a milkshake, you know, when you're a child. Um, here we have uh, with the pikelets. So instead of um, your typical pikelets with jam and cream, we've got jam and smooth ricotta. So it's, it's very similar to, to cream, yet the protein content's a lot higher in the ricotta. Um, down the bottom here, we have uh, some fruit and yogurt um, uh, glasses. And that's really easy. It's basically two or three ingredients. You can use fresh fruit, use um, canned fruit, and that's quite a, an easy um, snack to prepare. And quite, you can diversify um, that. And then looking at some main meal options here, something like in the middle, chili con carne. It's um, quite a popular dish. The, the, you know, you can use all different types of minced meat. Could be a chicken, turkey, um, beef mince, pork and veal, and including legumes like red kidney beans, chickpeas, lentils. That's actually giving the meal an extra boost of protein and fibre, which is good for, for regularity. Uh, when you're serving fish down here in the uh, right hand side, um, my nana's in resident, my 96 year old uh, nana, she's in residential aged care and she uh, is often served just plain steamed fish, which she calls naked fish, which is very boring. You know, think about taste and flavour. That's, you know, it doesn't have to be compli complicated, but we, we want to make it tasty and enticing. And then we have a picture here of some uh, modified textured, uh, of a modified textured meal, uh, which is used food moulds to make it presentable. And so you can identify exactly what the food is. And up the top here, there's a lasagna and that's um, incorporated some tofu and some textured uh, vegetable, vegetable protein to really give that meal a bit of a, a protein boost uh, for the vegetarian meal. All right, so Sue uh, covered not very nicely um, the dining experience, so I'll just touch a little bit on this. In terms of food appeal, so we, we eat with our eyes and our nose first. So, you know, um, have a look at the food. How does it look? How does it smell? If it doesn't look appealing to you or it doesn't smell appealing to you, well, then why would it, why would it um, smell or look good to the resident? Um, the taste, um, is it flavoursome? Is it, you know, um, because it's really important that uh, to, to make it tasty because our ability to taste diminish, diminishes with age. Food temperature is vital. So we see in many cases these fantastic, nutritious, delicious meals presented and they are stone cold. I don't know about you, but I would not... <laughs> I'm not going to eat a stone cold meal. And why should our residents? Food texture. So think about: is it easy to cut, to chew, swallow, and enjoy? We've got to we've got to think about these things. The presentation um, of the texture of modified meal. It should be each component on the plate should be identifiable. You should be able to say, oh, okay, that that's actually carrot, and that's actually peas, and that that's the meat. And it's important not to mix them all together and drown them in gravy or sauce. Uh, the mealtime environment, making it a very pleasant ambience. So nice, clean, comfortable furniture, the cutlery, the crockery, the lighting, and having some nice background music could make all the difference. Having limited distractions. So the medicine trolleys, um, you know, I know that in some cases they are necessary, but there are ways to actually minimize that distraction. Posters that say caution, do this, do that, it's not very appealing in, in the um, in the dining environment. So try to avoid that where possible. And staff banter where staff are um, chit-chatting in the corner and laughing can be a bit of a distraction. It's important to make it relaxed and, and, and not rushed. Um, and to give residents adequate time to enjoy their meals. 
Um, it's important to offer flexible dining options to meet the residents' prefer preferences. In some cases, that may be buffets. In other cases, self-service where that's appropriate. Menu ordering, extended meal times, and access to, to snacks any time of the day. They're, they're really important considerations. Um, providing exceptional food service, so to make the residents feel special, because they are special. And having the ability to share meals with, a, with family and friends, that's really important to, to um, cater for that. So how can a dietitian help? So a dietitian um, can help with one-on-one -on -one consultations, so to, um, to uh, meet with the, the residents and assess uh, what, what um, sort of issues, um, address any dietary issues, that may be for weight loss or malnutrition or diabetes, kidney disease, food allergies, food intolerances, that sort of thing. Dietitians can help with malnutrition assessments. So for those who are for those residents identified at risk of malnutrition, they can assess the menu, the food offerings and mealtime experience for quality improvement. They can support services to provide nutritious food offerings. They can collaborate with multidisciplinary healthcare teams to optimise quality of life. They can conduct nutrition education sessions for aged care staff, food service teams and residents. So it may be uh, an in-service on malnutrition screening or it could be on high energy, high protein diets or maybe nutritious finger foods for people with dexterity issues and for those who are uh, wanderers who are on the go and so on. Uh, dietitians can prescribe oral nutrition supplements and enteral feeding regimes and also audit food and nutrition related care plans. For example, review oral nutrition supplement protocols. So in terms of assessing the menu in the mealtime um, environment, Dietitians Australia last year developed a, a, an assessment tool um, called the Menu and the Mealtime Quality Assessment for Residential Aged Care. And it has been developed uh, for the exclusive use by accredited practicing dietitians. So this is a, a tool for their toolkit to be able to, um, to come into a home and assess, assess um, the menu, the food offerings and the, uh, the, the dining environment. So it provides aged care homes with an expert assessment and recommendations for nutrition care the menu and the mealtime experience. And the assessment uses the eight age care quality, quality standards as the framework. So when it comes to um, assessing food, uh, nutrition and the dining experience, um, it's best practice to have a dietitian conduct an on-site visit. So assessing the, the paper menu, the written menu is not best practice. And, and we actually um, would discourage that. So, um, you know, the, the paper menu, the written menu, isn't always a reflection of what's being offered in the home. So it's really important um, for, for when a dietitian comes in to assess all of these things, that they come on site and they would probably spend a whole day from breakfast through to supper um, to be able to, to do all of these things listed here. Um, they would, um, so a best practice assessment um, in that, a dietitian will conduct interviews with relevant staff, for example, the hospitality manager, the head chef or the cook, um, the care manager or the clinical manager. There will be an assessment of the menu and the actual food offerings to, to ensure that they marry up. There will be observations of the meal service, so the, the dietitian will have a look at the food being cooked and, and being plated up and served to residents. There will be weighing of sample meal components to determine how many serves of, fed, of meat, vegetables, fruit, dairy foods, grain foods are provided at each meal. And there will be a review of documentation relevant to nutrition care, like policies and procedures on oral nutrition supplement provisions. So the aim is to bring a range of disparate information together to really understand the food service and mealtime environment. So on completion of this type of assessment, providers will receive from the dietitian a written report with expert feedback on 
the nutritional value of the menu for most diet types, including texture modified diets, uh, feedback on the mealtime experience, aiming for best practice that provides an environment that encourages eating, as well as feedback um, and recommendations and a corrective action plan to using continuous improvement plans specific to the menu, meals, mealtime environment and nutrition care. And it's really vital that there is oversight to ensure the recommendations and the corrective action plan are actually actioned as outlined. So appointing a food and nutrition champion within your, within your uh, organisation with oversight of the recommendations and the corrective action plan is advisable. So in terms of uh, handy, uh, this is actually a handy resource for residential aged care. It's called the Best Practice Food and Nutrition Manual for Aged Care. Um, it was, uh, it's got New South Wales um, funding for that, but it's actually um, applicable to all states and territories um, for all providers in Australia wide. It's, it's not just a New South, New South Wales um, manual. So within that, there's lots of topics which are covered like food, nutrition and hydration requirements, tips to maximise the nutrition content of food offered, um, dining room ambience, malnutrition prevention and management, finger foods and much, much more. So I would just, um, strongly recommend that you um, have a little look at that. Uh, if you don't, if you're not currently engaged with a dietitian and you would like some assistance with to have a menu and a mealtime um, assessment conducted or perhaps some, some help with looking at, um, you know, uh, malnutrition screening and that sort of thing, you can actually search for a dietitian at the website listed here. Um, and just some couple of tips. Um, if you're on the homepage, if you go to find a dietitian, you can enter your postcode and select a kilometre radius. And for the health condition, if you select aged care, that will help you to um, uh, locate a dietitian with uh, that level of um, with aged care expertise. And there's just a couple of numbers there and um, an email if you would like some more helpful information. So that's it from me. Thank you, Vanessa. Well done. The, we now move to the final in our, in our suite of uh, expert panellists. Uh, and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Kate Dalton. Uh, Kate is a, an aged care advocate who, as I said earlier, does work with the Elder Rights Advocacy um, Group. And uh, Kate's going to talk to us logically uh, about the resident in aged care and their, from their perspective, uh, what works for them. Kate. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm attending this meeting from Wurundjeri country and acknowledge and pay my respects to past, present and emerging traditional owners. Now, the presentation that I'm gonna to give to you today, you will see that the residents' perspectives actually mirror what Melanie, Sue and Vanessa have already discussed. But um, for me, this is um, a really great thing that this has occurred because you're going to see direct quotes from residents and the way it has mirrored what you've seen today, for me, sitting here listening to my colleagues has really impacted on, it all meshes in so well together. So with no further ado, I'll get started. As I, that, That's me, that's my organization rather, Elder Rights Advocacy. And welcome, as I've said. I'm gonna start with some photographs that um, always impact on me. These are photographs that were taken by family and, and or representatives of residents living in aged care. I'm going to tell you what they are. And when I finished showing you the photographs, I will uh, state the obvious on what is actually missing from these dishes where relevant. So this is dinner. And this is described on the menu as crumbed chicken with roast potatoes. You can see that uh, this resident here has a fork and a spoon. That was all that was presented to him to eat the meal in his room. This gentleman has a, a diagnosis of dementia and 
often the food is still on the plate when the staff return. He often chooses to eat in his room. And the, uh, it came to our organization because of the weight loss of the resident. Just bear with me one moment. This next slide shows a couple of more meals. The one on the left is described on the menu as roast beef with potato scallops and carrots. Now, you may think, well, it might just be the quality of the photograph. The potato is on the left, the beige color. The carrots are below. Um, they are quite burnt, as you can see, because they were put in with the roast. And I think that was intended to be caramelized, but this was the end result for residents uh, for lunch that day. On another day in the same facility, on the right is lunch again, and the menu descri is describing this meal as beef stroganoff with rice. Now, um, when I first saw this photograph, I, I actually could not ascertain what that was. That was the photo that threw me the most. That was taken by the daughter of a resident living in residential aged care who we met with the facility with in relation to the quality of the food. And that was done obviously with the permission of the resident and the family. That's the, the efficacy path that they chose to take. This is dinner. Uh, here we have quite self-explanatory. It's sausage and mash with gravy. Um, again, not appetizing except for the potato that we saw on one of the earlier pictures. Uh, no vegetables were offered with any of these meals. It's not a question that vegetables were there to be, but the resident chose not to eat them. They were simply not plated up for those residents. These photographs were not taken in uh, one facility. They were taken in several facilities and I've gathered them over the last couple of years. The next one is the boiled egg for breakfast. When the egg was opened up, as you can see, it was moldy inside. Now, in this particular case, the resident uh, was not able to ascertain that the egg was moldy. His daughter was with him and she tapped open the egg. He was having a late breakfast that day, so she was able to be there. And her concern was, what if he had eaten this? Now, my colleagues have talked about access to fresh fruit um, at the facility. And one of the things that I see regularly is indeed that there, there is fresh fruit there. However, I would question its freshness. Often facilities will have the fruit in a bowl. It is generally bananas. Uh, sometimes it is apples, but generally I see bananas. Um, often residents are not aware that that fruit is there. Often residents don't know that it's real fruit. Um, and facility staff will say to me, we offer this stuff, it's not eaten. Here is a picture of a, some bananas taken from a fruit bowl in a facility. That's not fresh, that doesn't look appetizing. And each time I look at these photographs, I think you will join me in agreeing with they are actually quite confronting to see. And the question that has to be asked um, is, which my colleagues have already spoken about, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just glancing at the clock because I'm realizing I, I have a tendency to go over. Um, but one of the questions that um, I have asked facilities, and again, this is when the family and the resident have chosen representation from OPAN. I have asked the chef, the head dietitian, and the clinical nurse coordinator and the manager who attend, who are generally are the staff that will attend a meeting concerned concerning food. When these photographs, uh, the photograph that's particular to that facility, when we uh, show that to the facility, we ask the question that my colleagues have asked earlier, if this was presented to you in a restaurant, would you eat it or would you return it? The answer is I wouldn't eat it. The question, of course, is obvious, as we all know. Then why is it being served at your facility? Why is this acceptable? So I'm going to move on to my next slide now, because as 
you know, you're experts in this, in facilities, there are six opportunities a day to provide, to, sorry, I beg your pardon, to provide a variety of good quality food. And as we know, that's breakfast, morning tea, lunch, afternoon tea, dinner, and supper. Those um, photographs that I showed you, I want you to go back to those in your mind and think about lunch and dinner. Was that an opportunity to provide good food? Certainly not. And I think it's an opportunity to get it right. Six times a day, facilities have that chance to get it right. Um, the reality, unfortunately, is for, in many facilities, it's not right. And um, throughout this webinar, we will also be touching on things that we have seen and observed where it is, it is um, good food and it's being um, successfully presented and how's that being achieved. But right now, I'm going to move on to my next slide, which is um, as what residents have said about the food that they are receiving in residential aged care. Now, OPAN partnered with the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission in completing food surveys. And what you are about to see mirrors the uh, what's the discussion points that Melanie, Vanessa and Sue have uh, raised with you earlier. So what do residents tell us about the food and dining experience? As you can see, these are quotes. The food is cold by the time it gets to the dining room and it's far away from the kitchen. That's been touched on before. This is a very interesting one that comes up time and time again. Because staff eat their own meal once they've cleared the dining room and collect, collected empties from the rooms, they tend to rush and we don't have enough time to eat our meals at a leisurely pace. Yesterday, I was doing an information session with residents at a facility here in Victoria. And um, it transpired very quickly uh, what the residents wished to talk to me about that day. And it was about food. Uh, the primary uh, topic point for them was food. And the that comment there, the rushing, the residents were saying that when they uh, wish to eat a meal in their room, they have 10 minutes to do that because the food is brought to the room and 10 minutes later, staff will appear and uh, ask them if they finished. If they haven't finished, they will say, we will come back shortly um, and pick up the empty plates. The plates are not collected again until the evening meal. Residents have said that that feeling of being rushed feels very disrespectful and very institutionalized for them. Let's have a look at the next quote, more staff in the dining room over and over again. This is a theme that residents and their representatives will share with us here at OPAN. This is an interesting one and very confronting for residents, staff decide who sits where. Now, when I've raised that with managers before, the response that I have received is, that's not the case, Kate. This is where this resident always sits. My perspective on that is institutionalization happens very, very quickly. Just imagine if you, that person, if I sat down in the chair for a week, you could assume that that's my preference. What if a staff member came over to me and said, want to try it over here? Let want to sit over here. Might, just might make a difference to me. It's about the disempowerment of it. And that's why I think that these statements that residents are making to us in this survey and make to us every day on the telephone and make to us in our information sessions really resonate and mirror what, what we've learnt earlier on this evening. I'm going to move on to my next slide. And that is residents' suggestions on what can be done to improve the food and dining experience. And again, more mirroring of what we've already heard. These are, these are quotes from the residents. We've heard it already. Cook fresh vegetables with fresh quality meat and chicken. Please go back to those photographs that I showed you earlier. That didn't look too appetizing. Serve fresh fruit and make it available at any time, not just meal times. Remember what I spoke about earlier, that resident, sorry, facilities do uh, do that. Fruit is in a bowl, but that is not encouragement to eat it. Keep, remind residents that it's there. 
That's important. Look at the next one, more menu choice. We've talked about that as well. Now, often when we go into facilities, uh, we will see um, the menu is on a whiteboard and it's been written up uh, what's there. A year, sorry, a year ago, I beg your pardon. Two years ago, two and a half years ago, prior to lockdown, I went into a facility where the uh, that is exactly how the menu was available to be seen. However, it was on a blackboard like you find in a cafe and it was written with chalk and whoever had written it had the most amazing writing, but it felt a little bit more like a cafe rather than the whiteboard with the uh, black texture on there. More colorful vegetables. How important is that? Again, I'll go back to yesterday. The residents described the vegetables. They described the uh, green vegetables as khaki green and soggy, which just about sums up my cooking skills because uh, people often think that because I talk about food that I, I love cooking. I don't. And many of our residents didn't love cooking, but they know what good foods taste like, what it looks like and what it smells like, which my colleagues have already discussed with you. Have a look at this quote, a chef that listens to feedback. How important is that? Now, this one here I've put in, I've lost a lot of weight since being here. Please make them serve better food. That really should be on the previous slide and I apologize for that. But I do think that it has a really big impact again on um, how residents feel. And this is, there's, so much feedback that's come in this form and these are just snapshots of it and one of the things before I end this I'd just like to raise uh, which is not actually in my slides is that often I'm asked what is the biggest barrier for people to make a complaint or provide feedback on food and I'll tell you what it is from my anecdotal experience as an advocate uh, in this space and it's fear of reprisal and as you know, the Charter of Rights, number 12, talks about fear of reprisal, but it's a very real thing for residents themselves. And it's also for family members because family members and their representatives will say to me, I do want to make a complaint about the food or I want to offer some insight into how my relative wishes to eat. But I'm afraid that if I do, I'll be perceived negatively and that may have an impact on my loved one. And that is a very, very real concern that um, family members have and resident, residents themselves. And I'll leave you finally with two more quotes that are not actually in the uh, slideshow, but they have been touched on. And these are quotes again, directly from residents and their uh, family members. Cutlery isn't clean. Tablecloths need replacing. They're gray and they're threadbare. There's no view, we just stare at the walls. And the one that I think has a really big impact is please make the dining room more welcoming. I wouldn't want my family to eat here. That's the, the consumer's perspective, or as I always say, residents. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, well done. And um, some powerful messages that you've communicated there. Let's now move to, briefly to questions and answers. And we do have a bit of time left and I want to take some of the questions that we've received. Kate, I'm going to stay with you. And I wonder whether you can briefly address this question. Um, it, it's come in a, as, a, as a, a series of thoughts. And effectively it's, um, it goes to the point that Sue was making where a resident will express a food preference, which is not necessarily supported by their family member. So that you get that dissonance between what an individual seems to enjoy eating and what their family member is saying is acceptable or not acceptable. Do you have any tips for how uh, an aged care service might manage that? Thank you, Janet. Um, this is a question that, that does come up regularly. And um, I think it, it, it always takes me back to the charter and that is the residents' right to dignity and respect and to have their preferences respected. Often um, family members will say, I know what's best for my relative. 
Now, when that happens, and again, this is, um, as you said, Janet, tips and hints, I will often find myself with two in a position where I, there are two opposing views. There is the resident's perspective on what they would like to eat, what they enjoy, and there is the family's perspective on what, for want of a better expression, is good for them. What the family may perceive as a choking risk. That is not based on any clinical information, it's what they've read themselves or just their own anecdotal perception. When that happens, I will talk about the points in the charter and I will reiterate with the family member in the presence of the resident about that choice and uh, it's so important and if there is a if there's a real concern that is not going away from the family about any kind of risk about eating a certain type of food and the resident may say um, it's not a risk or it's my choice then I will talk about perhaps we could have a look at um, having a, an assessment of what what's going on there is it real these concerns that you have or is what's what's this bring brought about but the key thing, the key message is talking about it, raising raising it with them, not no assumptions to be made and always coming, myself as an advocate, always coming from the resident's perspective, which at times can put me in opposition to the family's perspective. Mm -hmm. But that is what I'm here to do as an aged care advocate and of course all my colleagues in open. I hope that sheds some light. Thank you, Thank Kate. You. Well done, thank you. Um, question for Sue, I think, uh, and it, it's coming this way. Uh, we have some problems in ensuring that some of our residents with dementia have adequate nutrition. That is, that they get enough food and it's the right sort of food. Uh, I wonder, Sue, whether you have any suggestions to offer uh, that would assist that, that particular service. Yeah, I think I think firstly, thanks, Janet. I think firstly, we need to look at why the person isn't eating. You always need to go back to that. If the person hasn't got ad adequate nutrition, I mentioned a number a number of things, obviously, within my presentation. But also, you know, how are staff um, presenting the food? Are they doing it in a way that it's like, oh, this is yuck? Especially if it's a modified diet, that can actually stop somebody adequately taking in food. Um, sometimes it can be things like the the, the plate size. Um, um, we have a lot of people where they came from a time where rations were around. And so if you present food that's too much on a plate, they actually would prefer not to have it than actually waste food. Um, again, looking at, you know, when we provide food, um, Kate talked about the, the six times that people can eat. But I'd like to think that it's actually outside that even because we have people who are classed as pacing the corridors at night. They're up at night and staff often try and put the person back to bed. But often that person may be up at night because they're actually hungry. And so, you know, we need to um, provide food outside that where if the person is pacing. Is that one of the reasons that they're actually pacing? Um, and again, you know, like the, those visual prompting, are we assisting people to maintain independence? Because for somebody where their dignity is completely gone, if you're assisting them to eat, they actually won't eat, especially if they're in a dining room that's being watched by everybody else. That might be very uncomfortable for them. So we need to consider the person's comfort within that as well. But there's thousands of reasons, really. I could talk for 10 hours on this, but um, there's just there's just some ideas for you. Oh, that's great. That's a, that's, that's a wonderful place to start and I think you've probably prompted some some further considerations by the services who are watching tonight. Um, one for you Vanessa, the question's coming in, how do you identify why someone isn't eating? Thanks Janet. Uh, yeah I mean th th there's a plethora of reasons why someone may not be eating so it takes a bit of uh, work to figure that out. So it could be like like Melanie mentioned in her um, talk earlier. So it could be a clinical or a medical reason. Is it an oral issue? Do they have an abscess in the mouth? Is it um, the dentures aren't quite fitting the, as well as they used to because they've lost weight? Is it a swallowing issue, which then would require a swallow, swallowing assessment by a speech pathologist? Um, uh, is it, you know, there could be other medical issues. Is it constipation or loose bowels? We know that in some cases uh, when people have loose bowels, they're actually embarrassed. So they actually try to restrict their food intake because they don't want to, to you know, um, experience that, you know, um, so often. Uh, is it dehydration? So dehydration actually reduces appetite. 
so uh, or frailty and having you know low low sort of stamina or, and being very lethargic in that not being have, not having the energy to be able to sit up properly and eat the meal. Yeah. So there could be clinical medical reasons. There could be psychological reasons. Um, you know, uh, could be mental. Could be a mental health issue. Um, you know, suffering from depression and so on. Or is it simply the fact that they don't don't they're not satisfied with the food, <laughs> but which is which is you know quite a valid reason. Um, is the food coming to them cold? Is it uh, not to their taste? Is it um, yeah? So so there's you know it takes a little bit of probing to find that out. Um, I would say that you know to engage a dietitian to to actually to be able to determine these some of these things if you're finding it difficult. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm going to stay with you because there's another question that I suspect a dietitian would be well placed to answer. Uh, we've tried using food moulds to make textured meals more presentable, uh, but we've had some negative feedback from residents. And I think Sue touched on this as well. Um, do you have any other ideas we could try? Yeah, in some cases, like the, the ice cream scoops can actually, if it's done correctly it's in, and presented nicely with some, you know, uh, you know, without pouring the gravy and, and making it look like you know islands swimming in in the ocean, can that it can the, the the scoops can actually work quite okay. Piping um, can actually look you know can give different textures and different looks. Um, but it's just about you know working with um, and you know the, the chefs and the cooks experimenting to see you know, what can actually be done there and then present it to, you know, residents and, and get their feedback on it. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we, I might go to Melanie for the final question. And Melanie, um, be, you know, encompassing if you if, as you wish. Um, it's a maybe a possibly an unfair question without notice, but if you had to identify one thing about food, meals, um, nutrition, the dining experience, and 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 residents' pleasure, um, that aged care providers should have squarely in the front of their minds as they go about uh, addressing some of their challenges in this area, what would it be and why? I think that the best way I think of it is if I was going to, or people can put themselves, if you were going to go into residential care, try to think about what you would be giving up in relation to food and dining. And if a provider can elicit what those things are, <clears throat> which is quite simple, um, then many of those gaps can be filled preemptively or or um, in response to to later finding out. So I would I would say that the true person centeredness, um, the true giving the the absolute clear impression that you care about their food and their eating, and and just asking them what what food do you miss now that you've come into this home, or what would be a treat for you? And I've heard some fabulous stories addressing that where. You know, a, a woman was looking a little bit sad, not like this lovely woman in the slide, but one one of the staff just said to her one day, you're looking a bit down, you know, what, what's wrong? And she said, I haven't had a mango for two years. And that staff member went and bought her a mango and she smiled for a week. Um, there are uh, other other lovely stories. Uh, I went to a, an aged care home in uh, the re remote Northern Territory, actually, which was just very small, only Aboriginal women in the home. And the manager changed and the chef at the time was was a person who was really, his, his repertoire was curry. And she was thinking, that's a bit strange. And she said to the, to the ladies, you know, what do you think of the food? And they were saying, oh, it's, it's all right, it's all right. And, they, and she said, yes, but you don't eat it. And, and she really felt that they just didn't want to be impolite and criticise the food, even though the curry was a totally alien flavour to them. And when the cook changed and the meals were able to be more familiar to them, they all put on weight, every single person in that service. And they were eating bully beef and kangaroo tail and eating around a, a fire 
the food was cooked in a fire where the flavours were smoke and not curry, um, and therefore they were familiar, comforting, and they ate, ate with gusto. Um, another another individualised story is actually a, a friend's mother who was in was in a service. There was no particular issues with the service, but, but every morning um, they came in and they'd say, um, are, are we having tea or coffee this morning? And she'd say, I don't drink tea or coffee. I never drink tea or coffee. Every morning they asked her. And she just happened to move to another service closer to her daughter. And as she walked in the door, they said, so, Edie, they used her name, not what are we having. Um, what does breakfast look like to you? And she said, I don't drink tea. I don't drink coffee. I love an orange juice. I love a piece of toast. And she was never offered tea or coffee again. So those are things where the person is so pleased to be treated as an individual and as special in some way um, that it makes a huge difference for what really is a relatively small amount of, of effort. I think if if people do read the um, the HOI paper on our complaints where there are a number of individual quotes, the actual essence of the complaint are, are specified there. Some of them would break your heart. It's very poignant reading um, and most of them have very, very easy fixes. So I would I would just really, I think, try and put yourself in, in the shoes of, of the person and really try to think what would make this person's food really good for them and it's often really easy oh thank you and a lovely way to sum up the the webinar content um thank you melanie um that probably brings us to the end and i'll, I'll make some closing remarks um first of all my thanks to the panelists melanie sue vanessa and kate i think you've done a really champion job and and i expect that those online would agree um there will be a link uh to a survey in the chat uh, if it's not there already and we really would ask if you would do it spend just a moment of your time now answering the questions in that survey because we want to hear your thoughts uh, on the key messages you're going to take away what uh, has inspired you or has prompted you to reconsider some of your approaches and we'd also like feedback on this webinar How, has it been useful for you have it have you found it uh, to be informative uh, what could we do better um, you will also find a link to a, a goal planning template, uh, and I encourage you to download it and uh, try it out at your service, possibly. If you have good success stories about food, nutrition, the dining experience, and you are willing to share them with us, please do send it to our email address at info, I-N-F-O, at agedcarequality, or one word, agedcarequality.gov.au. Just tell us what you've done well, what has been an outstanding success so that we can have the opportunity of sharing it all widely. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We weren't able to get to them all and I'm particularly sad not to have managed to address one from Hayley and another one from Heather. Um, we will be putting a Q&A sheet on our website where we pick up those questions we didn't manage to get to. So please visit the website uh, and keep in touch with the progress of, of this uh, this uh, this program that we've undertaken here. Just to recap, this is the first of four webinars we'll be holding with you. The next webinar is going to focus on measures of good practice. Uh, I understand we may have scheduled it already. I think it's happening in November and we'll obviously get more information out to you to confirm the particular date. Uh, and if you're interested, we're holding a raft of other webinars as well uh, over coming weeks and months because uh, it's, a, it's a busy time in relation to the introduction of a whole raft of reforms of aged care uh, and we're doing our level best to make sure that all providers are well informed and are given sufficient guidance and support to lift yourself into a new way of working and make sure that you are able to meet the new expectations which are being placed upon you. So thank you everyone uh, who stayed with us for the, for the hour and a half. I do hope you've managed to get something from this. Tell us what you think in the survey and uh, we look forward to re-engaging with you in the next webinar. Thanks everyone and have a great evening. <laughs>